That was my vacationing family. Oh, it's the other way around. We were the ones on vacation, right? <laughs> it is good to be back. Hey, let's thank the band for what they did this morning. Good job. Thank you, guys. Uh, Nick shared with us, he was uh, spending the night in Childress. He wasn't going to drive all the way through, and we had some drive all the way through, and I think Joey and Rodney made it. The rest are probably still sleeping in this morning. Everybody got in real late last night, so, you know, it was a unique thing that happened. Uh, the vacation was just great. You get in those Colorado mountains, and when we got there, everything was green, and then halfway through the week, it started turning yellow and red, all those beautiful colors, so it was a neat time to be there. Um, I got uh, ready to go one morning, and I went out to my UTV to get in it, and uh, Bigfoot was strapped to the in the seatbelt in front of the steering wheel, uh, trying to drive off my UTV. So that was an interesting thing that uh, someone pulled on me. You know, we had a great time. It was uh, uh, weather conditions up there, about 33, 32 in the morning, 75, maybe 80 at a high, and uh, it was uh, just a... Uh, it was, it was fun. We had a great time, and it's always uh, fun to go, but it's great to be back. And many of you know that vacation was for a whole week. And we had several, this time, of our church members uh, that traveled with us. We went to a little town up in the mountain, Colorado mountains, called Lake City, Colorado, if any of you have ever been. If you haven't, it's a beautiful little town, small town, maybe even a little bit larger than Palmer, but close to the same size, but real small town. And we went there to relax and enjoy the beauty of the mountain area because you can actually unwind and uh, uh, really rest and relax unless you play hard like we did. And we had our largest group of uh, 14 uh, people on this trip, which is the largest one we've had. And I can say with confidence, what an adventure. And the reason I say adventure, because of the many different personalities among our group. And I'm telling you, we had so many different personalities in this group. It threw some excitement to it. I found there are uh, some people more adventurous than others, though. Uh, for some, adventure means hiking, mountain climbing, or even riding over the mountains in those UTVs. But for others, it means trying to find uh, trying to, uh, a new kind of food <laughs> or shopping. That's their adventure. You know, and some had that going on. And then there are those who just want to uh, enjoy a safe adventure. They, they don't want to venture out and get too uh, squirrely out there in what we were doing. So we had all kinds of personalities in this group. And our first day was just a short drive. We only went 40 miles, uh, getting everybody used to driving in the mountains. And so we drove about 40 miles over and around the mountains. And that may sound like a lot to you. Uh, that is a pretty good trip. But uh, the next day encompassed a ride of 76 miles in one day, 10 and a half hours in those UTVs, and that was a ride. That's the longest ride I've ever been on, and I think everybody else uh, uh, would say the same. That was pretty tough. The next morning, uh, you know, that's a long day for everybody. The next morning, we're going to ride the train from Durango to Silverton, which is a beautiful ride if you ever get a chance to do it. The only thing I wouldn't do is stay in Lake City to do that because from, for us, we had to be on that train at 8.30. And that was a four-hour drive to Durango from where we were at, over the mountains, in the dark. So that was a little trying, I would say. And uh, we got there, and the train goes all the way over to Silverton. You get a two-and-a-half-hour layover where you can eat and shop and do all the things in the beautiful town of Silverton. And then you got that train ride back. We got back about 6.30, and then we have to drive four hours all the way back in the dark. And when I say drive in the dark, you're in the mountain where some of those switchbacks are, you know, 10 to 15 mile an hour turns, or you run off the mountain. And during that time, you also got to watch for the big mule deer, elk, everything else that can run out in front of you. So there were a lot of uh, these guys that had cramps in their hands from hanging on that steering wheel, driving back over. So it was a challenge, but it, it was really good. And sometimes the adventure started before we ever left our cabin area. I mean, our adventure started right there at the cabins. A couple of mornings, it was like herding cats or chickens. You could not get everybody together. You could not get them going the right direction. You know, it was, it was one of those personality things. And trying to get everybody together and headed out for the morning. Some mornings, that was a challenge. Somebody would forget something or something would go wrong. And all at once, you know, when you're running as groups, 
You always want to make everybody make sure everybody's in the group so you don't lose anybody. So you look up and you got two or three minutes and you got to go back and you got to figure out what's going on because phone service up there was terrible. Cell service was terrible. We didn't know anything was going on back here in the world until we got back pretty close to where we had service to find all that out, which was a good thing. And the reason, once again, falls back for all this thing that goes on in the morning when we start out, it falls back on different people's personalities. Some were not good early risers. I can, I can testify to that, but when I get there, I got up pretty early. Some were light breakfast eaters. Others were big breakfast eaters. And then some ate no breakfast at all. You had some in the group that woke up prepared and ready to go. They had everything set. It was already in their vehicle. They're ready to go. While others just got out of bed, threw on some clothes, threw things together, just in time to head out for the day. So you had all those different personalities working together, which was, it was pretty cool. I'll leave you all wondering uh, who each one was that fits those descriptions, but you can figure that out for yourself. You know, as we rode the mountain area, we would come upon some old settlement towns, mining towns from the early 1800s, 1900s. And when reading about the history of the towns and the mining areas there, I reflected on the people living there at the time and how they also had many different people with different personalities that may have presented a challenge to accomplish the many tasks that need to be, needed to be done to survive in those mountains. And the varying weather and the environment and I'm not talking about mining towns at the bottom of the mountains. I'm talking about mining towns and small towns and people living miles up into the mountains, up where it's 11, 12,000 feet above sea level, where snow and rain. And there at that time, we were informed that because we kept seeing all these trees, these big pine trees, beautiful pine trees that had been dead. They were all at the bottom of the mountain down near the creeks and all that. And they informed us they had had a lot of rain, but the rain wasn't the problem. They had avalanches that they've never really had much of up there. Even right in their town, they said they had an avalanche that uh, damaged the uh, fire chief's home there. So they had a lot going on up there, and it washed out the roads and all that kind of stuff. But think about the challenges, and, and we did that. When we got to a mountain, mining town, believe it or not, there would be several structures there that were still standing, and there would be some that were just... You know, they, they'd, they'd fallen away, you know, fell apart. They used that old wood where they soaked it in creosote to make it last. But the history, you, you stop to think about what it took, the people, the challenges, the leaders that were, were strong enough to lead people with all these different personalities up there to do what they did. At 12,000 feet, you know, we have pretty good roads that... Uh, that we got to ride on in our UTVs are only wide enough for a couple of Jeeps or a couple of UTVs to go up. And back then, they probably weren't even that wide, but they rode up these things with mule teams, hauling stuff in. And if you think about it, a, 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 a train engine that they needed up there at those mines, they hauled it over those mountains and up those hills and everything through all of that with mule teams on a wagon. We read about, think about that, a whole engine of a train. It had to present so many challenges and once they got there, learning to deal with all the stuff, the weather and the environment, and the wild animals and everything, that had to be challenged. And in a group, even in a smaller group, you got all those different personalities that you got to deal with. If we were just to think about all the different personalities, how about all the different personalities we learn in the Bible? And it kind of coincided with our trip this week that got me thinking about that uh, my wife had mentioned something early on, and I'll bring that to your attention here in a little bit. But uh, it kind of led me to thinking about, you know, all the personalities in our groups, all the personalities being dealt with, and the people being dealt with when they were trying to set up these mining towns and do mining in the area. You know, we knew the story about the circuit riders, which were the preachers that put on snowshoes, and they trekked through the snow over those mountain passes and all the, all the way up there just to get to these mining towns to bring the Word of God to people that needed it. And they were also carrying medical supplies with them. And they did that because they had a calling to do that, which was really cool. But think about the personalities in the Bible of the people. You know, Moses is a good example. Once uh, Pharaoh released all those people, look how many people that Moses had to lead. And I'm sure that was like herding cats, wouldn't you think? 
Because he had multiple personalities there in that group. And he had some challenges. And some of those personalities came into play immediately in the adventure that Moses took them on right to the edge of the Red Sea. Right there, you know, these people have been freed and they've got a good thing going on. But all at once, they're at the Red Sea right at the edge. And there's no way out. And here comes Pharaoh's army. They decide they don't want them to be free. And Moses has a mess on his hands there. And I'm sure he's getting an earful from everybody. So let's look at that this morning. Let's pick up in Exodus chapter 14, verse 10 this morning. Where we're picking up here, Moses already led the people to the edge of the Red Sea. They're ready there. They, they really don't know what they're going to do from there. But Pharaoh's decided that he doesn't want them to be free. So he's going to take revenge on them. So we pick up there at Exodus 14, chapter 14, verse 10. And we're going to be in a lot of scripture this morning, so you might hold your Bible open there. Exodus chapter 14, beginning at verse 10, says, As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to this desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Look, they're already whining and complaining. He's got people with the personalities that think this is the end. I was better off being a slave and being beat and dying and doing all that. Now I'm free, but here I am backed up and we're going to be killed right here. That's the personality of many people. And of course, what happened? He called on God. Raised his staff and parted the sea and they went across with ease. And once they got to the other side and they thought the army was still coming. And they're still whining and crying and bickering over. Here we go. We're going to die on this side. God closes the sea. Wipes out the army. I'm sure right then Moses goes, what did I get myself into? Right? Maybe. But he's doing what God called him to do. And in Moses' next adventure, and Moses had many adventures, just like we did in Colorado. He, but he had many more. But his next adventure, he found himself having to deal with the different personalities, once again, of the freed people at the base of Mount Sinai. So let's pick up there. We're going to Exodus. If you were in Exodus, just skip over to chapter 32, verse 19. We're picking up right where Moses has been up on the mountain. The people think that he's deserted them. He's not coming back. They're down there once again. They got this complaining and whining and bickering going on and all the different personalities throwing together and coming up with all these ideas of what we're going to do. We lost our leader. Now we're going to take action on ourselves. So this is where Moses comes back down off the mountain with the Ten Commandments. Picking up verse 19, chapter 32 in Exodus. You know, verse 19, when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned, and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it into powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. He said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that you led them into the such great sin? Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil? They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, them whoever has any gold or jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Moses saw that the people were running wild and that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. Okay, now you hear that? All the Levites rallied to him. But what happened to everybody else? Some of them still had the personality, hey, this calf's the, the real deal. This is the deal we need to be worshiping, you know. Uh, and and what, what I'm trying to get to here is all these different personalities, all these different quirks that people had, they all had their own thing going on and they all had an opinion 
You have to remember that. That's a big word nowadays. Everybody has an opinion, whether it's right or wrong. And Moses was having to deal with all this. And at some point, I, once again, I think um, Moses, he just said, man, God, I hope you know what you're doing. You know, you chose me to lead this. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of uh, struggling here. But God was right there with him. And while Moses was away with God on the mountain, why did the people beg Aaron for something to worship? Why would they do that? The answer is that humans are created to worship. We will either worship God, ourselves, money, fame, pleasure, success, and many other things. Because we were designed to worship. And this is where the different personalities are revealed. When you look at a person and you see what's most important to them, it will reveal their personality and their character. You know, there are many leaders in the Bible referred to that dealt with different personalities of the people they led on adventures. I believe that many of you would agree with me this morning that living a life for Jesus Christ is the greatest adventure a person can ever be part of. Because it is an adventure. But the reward for the adventure, the reward, reward for the personalities and dealing with the people and everything that comes together for me as a pastor, I know is one of the greatest things I've ever done. And I hope your walk with the Lord is the same. But the adventure I'm speaking of is having our lives transformed by God. To know in this adventure what real love is. To have our prayers answered by an invisible God himself. And to see godly miracles happen right before our lives. Being able to read a book of truth provided to us. To speak to the very core of our lives. That's an adventure. Through all of that. And that's the adventure that God has us on. And the path he has us on today. If you're a Christian follower of Christ. The adventure also includes being part of. What God is doing right here on earth. We're part of that. You look at me like what? Yes. You have your part in that adventure too. And you have your part in dealing with all the different personalities here on earth. Amen. And the greatest part is knowing that the adventure continues after we leave this earth. It just gets better. When we were in those mountains, the main thing that I kept hearing from everybody in the group is how majestic God's hand is. And how he developed this. Rodney Rickman brought this up and it was a great way to put it. Can you imagine this is what we're looking at right now. Which there were so many different formations. So many different things in those mountains. And beauty was there. Rodney said can you imagine when God created that. He said man I can't wait for this group from J Bar C to stand here. And see what I've done for them. When you can look at it that way then you're right with God because that's what he did. And he put us all together. Even though we have all these different personalities, he put us all together this week for a reason. As he puts all of us together each week right here in his church house for a reason. And I know each one of us deals with somebody with a different personality. Some that's a little harder than others. Don't look behind you. Don't look beside you. Come on. I believe one of Jesus' greatest adventures was gathering and leading his disciples. It had to be. Talk about dealing with different personalities. If you've read your Bible and you know the different personalities of the disciples, man, that had to be a challenge. He had Peter. Oh, my gosh. And his two unmistakable personalities. Peter had two going on there. And Jesus had to deal with that. The first is that he was at times a comically impulsive character. I like the way they put that. He had a little comedy about him, but he was impulsive. 
Twice he jumped out of a perfectly seaworthy boat. Fully clothed. He challenged Jesus. Get that. He challenged Jesus of all people. He spoke out a turn. And at times he seemed to demonstrate more energy and creativity than was appropriate for the moment. But it was that very energy and creativity that underlied the second impression of Peter. That was his first impression. Peter was the disciples' unofficial leader. Get that, unofficial leader. He made himself leader. He often served as their spokesman. He was the first one to step out and say something, whether it was right or wrong. I know, you think I'm like Peter. It's okay. <laughs> he was one of the three disciples in Jesus' inner circle, close to Jesus. Certainly after Jesus' departure, the disciples looked to Peter to give them direction. Did you realize that? Not Paul. Not the others. They looked to Peter to give them direction. Peter was an outspoken, unofficial leader. Peter was always thinking, though. And he always thought with a view toward action. Rather, while he was thinking, he's thinking, I got to take action on this. And he did. When he heard question, he immediately answered. When he observed a problem, he thought solution. When he encountered opinions, he thought decision. When he, <clears throat> but he also demonstrated the unfortunate side of that characteristic that he had going on. When he heard silence, he thought, I need to talk. Don't go there, dear. <laughs> Y'all don't listen to the cheap seats over here. She... When he encountered disagreement, he thought, oh, this is a challenge. This is a challenge. Any of you got that going on in your life? Sure you do. Some do. Some of you out here today are Peters. You have the same personality as Peter. I know I do. She makes me aware of that all the time. I know I do. And sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes that's a bad thing. In his younger years, Peter exercised little constraint at all when he was younger. And his answers, solutions, decisions, and his speech sometimes seemed just what they called buffish, just crazy. At times, his behavior was perceived as insensitive, inconsiderate, and immature. But like many great leaders, Peter survived himself. With Jesus' guidance. Peter's fertile and active mind matured. He grew in maturity because of Jesus Christ. And I want to say because of who his leader was and who he was around. Influenced him and changed, started to change some of the personalities in his life. Through all his experiences, he developed a more godly, Christ-like character. Today are we doing that? Are we striving to be like Jesus Christ in everything we do? During this same adventure, Jesus had to deal with the personalities of James and John, in which he gave the name Sons of Thunder. My wife, as we were driving up, she asked me, she said, do you know what name that Jesus gave James and John? I said, yeah. Was, I knew it was Thunder. I couldn't remember if it was Sons of Thunder. And she goes, I didn't know that. Many of you may not know that. He gave them that name. Because of their personalities is the reason he gave them that nickname. Jesus was totally aware of the personalities of these two men when he first met them. Of course, Jesus knows personally and knows the personality of all of us. But he knew this. When he chose them, he knew this. And in one just outstanding incident, we see that James and John possess some truly thunder-like qualities that was the reason he gave them that name. Turn with me this morning, if you would. We're going to be in Luke, chapter 9, verse 51.
Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 51. Picking up verse 51, it says, As time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers out ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading to Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call, call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Know anybody like that? <laughs> But Jesus turned and rebuked them. You know what? That's one of the reasons he gave them the nickname. They were ready to do battle. They were ready to defend Jesus. They were ready at a minute. Man, let's just rock and roll. We're going to get into it. That was their personalities. But think about it. Jesus knew when he selected them, their personalities. He knew he was going to get to deal with this. James and John's response to the Samaritans reveals impassion impulsivity, and anger that could be properly called thunderous. That's the way they were. And we can be sure that there were other times when James and John lived up to their nickname. I'm sure several times that we may not read in the Bible, but I may imagine several times that they, they walked with Jesus and he kept thinking, oh my gosh, these guys, they are thunderous. They're out there. But we find later, as they walked with Jesus. And this is so great. We find later that John. After walking with Jesus for a lifetime. The son of thunder. Earned a new name. A new nickname. He was called the apostle of love. Did you know that? Some did. Some didn't. So it shows. That our connection with Jesus Christ. Daily walking with Jesus Christ. And affirm that our personalities can be changed. And things inside of us can change for the better. But this is the good one. Also, during Jesus' adventure with the disciples, he dealt with the personality of Judas. Think about that. He knew. He knew the day he selected him of Judas' personality and what was going to happen with him. Let's pick up at John chapter 12, verse 6. And this, this uh, piece of scripture here reveals just a, a small part of Judas' personality. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of the disciples, Judas Azakar, Asher, Isaac Hard, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He not, did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. What a personality, and Jesus knew that was going on. But that revealed one of his personalities, and we kind of wonder why in the world would Jesus select him to be part of those disciples? Judas was in charge of the group's money and was a thief who regularly stole from it. It just said that. He was also known to be a liar. He was also deceitful and greedy. He was called a traitor and was identified as a betrayer during the last Passover. He was willing to pretend to honor someone for his own selfish purposes. He had a personality that wasn't very nice. His character didn't reveal very good things about him. But we know as we read on that Judas felt remorse for his action and knew he sinned when he turned Jesus over to be crucified or to be arrested. Let's look at Matthew chapter 27, verse 3.
Matthew chapter 27, picking up at verse 3. Verse 3, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. How sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. Judas made a mistake. He was remorseful. He realized that they weren't just going to set Jesus straight. They were going to crucify him and condemn him. He thought he was doing the right thing. He was going to get a little money out of it. It was going to be okay. You know, they'd, they'd arrest him and stuff, but he would get it, get out of it. Didn't happen that way. So Judas did feel remorse. His sorrow, however, did not lead to true repentance. Even though he felt bad about it, it didn't lead, lead to true repentance or a change of heart. And Judas, as it did for Peter, when Peter denied Christ, he had a change of heart. He had remorse. He felt really bad about that. So it didn't happen for Judas, and it led him to committing suicide, as we read. You know, for many years, companies have tried to choose employees who work well together by exploring the personality types of their candidates. Tests like the Myers-Briggs type indicator identifies attitudes and preferences and helps extroverts and introverts figure out how to work together that all have different personalities. This test, and, and we've taken this test, this test actually shows your personality and it shows what types work well together very well or get along very well together. And long before personality tests entered our world, God's Word had answers for how we can work and play well together. Even with people with different personalities. It's all in God's word. We didn't need a test. We need to read the Bible. Amen. Let's take a look right quick at a few ways that can be done. How can we work, live, and worship together in a better way? First of all, and this is a big one to me, don't take to heart all that people say. Because I'm bad about that. She'll tell you. Don't take to heart. All that people say. God's word warns us not to listen too closely to the complaints of other people. I guess that's how Moses made it through. I guess that's how Jesus dealt with it, I'm sure. Just don't listen to all that. Hanging on the words of others, hoping to hear praise for yourself or something you've done is a recipe for hurt feelings. It really is. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 21. Do not pay attention to every word people say or you may hear your servant cursing you. Don't pay attention to it. Don't, don't, don't let people steal your joy with that. Number two, recognize there's more to the story with people. We don't know the whole story. I would like to share with all of you this morning, but I'm not going to go there. We had some incidents happen on the way there. And there were two stories, one here and one here, and two storms brewing, and both of them came together at one time. But through prayer and dedication to each one, it turned around that quick. Only God himself can be in the midst of that. Everyone faces struggles. They need to keep to themselves. Even, oh, they try to keep to themselves. I better say that right. Even when a person is a spouse, a child, or a parent, there's always one more fact we know nothing about. You don't know what's going on with that other person, why they act that way, why they did what they did. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Four things. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Halt means when you're in one of those stages, you don't discuss things, you don't get into arguments, you don't challenge anybody because you're on the wrong path. Because one of those four things are driving you to say and do things you shouldn't do. Remember those four words. If you have to write it down, stick it up somewhere, it's called halt. That means stop. Don't go any further. 
because personalities are all over the place and emotions are high. But we don't know what's going on in another person's life. We see these people doing crazy things or acting crazy sometimes. Driving on the highway. We don't know what's going on with them. It can, can just be plain selfishness. But we don't know. Maybe they had a, a bad morning. Maybe they lost a loved one. Maybe they're struggling to survive. You don't know what's going on with that other person. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Rather, if you judge, God will judge you. The next one, allow for the fertilities of others. We think everybody should be like us. You know, I, sometimes I want my wife to wear my glasses. So she can see me how I see me. <laughs> she doesn't agree. Perfection can be deadly to a relationship. Or perfectionism. When you expect that out of somebody. It can be deadly to that relationship with them. God is compassionate. And he doesn't treat us as we deserve to be treated. When we fail. So why do we do that? He shows us grace and mercy. In every situation. When we call upon him. Because we're going to fail. We're going to fall down. We're going to do things that are just. Not pleasing to God. And that's, in, that's just in our DNA. It's in our personalities. And in our character. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. These in chapter 4, verse 32 says, Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. So if you're not willing to forgive, why would God forgive you? And the last one, learn to work well with others. Learn to work well with others. It is believed, and it's believed by me and many of you. And we saw it this week that God intentionally places, places us around people that challenge us. Amen, Rodney, Joey. God places people around us that challenges us. Each connection is for his purpose, not for ours. For every personality type, working well with people whose attitudes and preferences Defer from ours means that we stop jumping to conclusions about the motives of others and accept the fact that we don't know everything about every situation. Man, that shocked me. I thought I did. <laughs> we don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on in every situation. So we do need to learn to work well with others. Oswald Chambers says, always measure your life solely by the standards of Jesus. Do we do that? Ooh, that's scary. We might have to make some changes if we did that on a daily basis. First Peter chapter 2, 21 says, To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He is the example, right? After our many adventures throughout the week this week with the group, the personality of each person among us was revealed. One of my favorite times when we go on these trips is when we're getting ready to close out the week. Now, Terry and I, we were leaving on Friday afternoon, so we chose on Thursday after being worn out for the first three days to do nothing but go fishing. And we did that and come back in. And that night, we all cooked on the campfire, played a little cornhole and did that and uh, sat around a campfire. And each person I asked each time to share what memorable event that we could presented to them that was unforgettable to them. 
That's the greatest time of the whole trip is when people start to reveal what the trip meant to them and what they got out of it. And as I sat there and listened, I heard and witnessed God working throughout the group. He was with us. Even the man that was over the cabins that we rented was out there with us when we were out there eating and doing activities. And we asked him to join our group, which floored him that we would invite him to do that. He had a lot of things going on in his life. He, his mom and his brother helped run these cabins, and both of them had recently passed away. Left it all on him. His wife was bedridden. He had a lot going on. You could tell he was a Christian, though. But when we asked him to sit among us and included him and in everything going on, you could just see him light up that he was so appreciative of that. And he told us that. That night revealed to me that even, there, even though there were many different personalities that gathered together in the adventures of the week, God was in our midst and working in the hearts of everyone. Some of the things we heard and we witnessed would blow you away. On this trip more so than others. We know according to the Bible that as Jesus picked his disciples, he knew their different personalities and their quirks. And when I say quirks, people have lots of quirks. He also knew that the adventures that they were about to go on would reveal his character and how the personalities of these men would change as they walked with him. He knew all that. I saw that in this group. I saw how so many of them had appreciated everything they'd seen and everything they had done that drew them closer to God right before that time we met and how God was working in them. And basically what Jesus was doing, he was setting an example for his disciples to follow. If you choose to be a leader, if you choose to go out with a group and you want to be part of that leadership, then you need to be the example. I can say for myself and many others that joined us on this trip, we witnessed Miracles that only God could have created and revealed to us at that point. We did see that in so many different ways. But right there in that circle when we all shared and talked. 14 people. 15 including Mr. Moody, the man that had the, uh, had the deal. 15 people sitting in a circle around a glowing campfire. And we get ready to close for the night. And we call on prayer. And we say, well, we're going to do prayer different. We're going to let anybody just that wants to pray, pray. Not me do all the prayer or Rodney or Buster or anybody. We're going to let whoever wants to pray, pray. You know who all went on the trip, right? Many of you may not. But I want to tell you, there wasn't one person in that 15 that didn't pray that night. That's huge. There are people in that group never prayed before out loud to anybody. They were doing it right there on that spot. Did it take that moment in that campfire for God to open somebody's heart and say, speak to me? <laughs> we were all blubbering like babies. Trying to get through it. Because God was revealing how he could change people's personalities and character that we didn't have to do anything. Man, you're talking about powerful. If we didn't get anything else out of the whole trip, it was worth that moment at that time for all that to happen. Blew me away. God knows what he's doing. So why do we question him? Luke chapter 18, verse 27, Jesus speaking right here. What is impossible with man is possible with God. We confirm that. That was a true statement. And it was revealed to us in so many different ways. This morning, 
as you sit here, I pray that each of you are prepared to use the personality that God has given you to reveal his love, grace, and mercy to others in whatever your next adventure might be. Be the leader, set the example, and be like Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We lift this day to you, Father. We are just blessed beyond belief. We are so thankful that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross to cover our sins and shortcomings in our lives. Father, we thank you for the safety you provide each and every day to us as we call on you. Father, we thank you for this church, this building, this church family. Father, even when we're away, we have confidence that you're with each and every one of our family members here back at home. Father, I know there's some good things working out there. I know there's adventures coming into these people's lives that they're going to need to step up and be the example of you. Father, I pray this morning that as we go through the struggles in our lives, Father, that we strive to be like you, Jesus. That we would put him first in our lives, that we would walk with him daily, that the rough personalities in our lives and our character would start to change and be revealed to the others around us that might draw others closer to you. Father, let us be the light and the witness. Father, I pray this morning that everything we said, everything we did was uplifting, glorifying, and pleasing to you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.